Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. And on behalf of Gaming Taurus of New Jersey, it's a pleasure for us to be here. And greeting from my congregation, uh, Christ the Liberator and St. David's in Cranberry. One of the most difficult things to do when planning a large party like a wedding reception is what? Where are you going to see everyone? You know that certain people have to sit closer to the head table. You just have to do it. Like it or not, then there are those people who you know really don't like each other, but you don't know how to put them in the different sections of the hall. Then there are those who talk to each other and will say, hey, I'm going to such and such wedding um, on Saturday. Are you going? Uh, no. Oops. <laughs> so you need to decide if I invite this couple, I kind of have to invite that couple, even though I don't really want to. And where do I sit them all? Closer to us, further back, then there are those you have to invite, but honestly, you don't care if they where they sit or even if they come. Yep, I admit it. If you're planning to win in a banquet like that, you've had to deal with these issues. Well, today we're going to look at the dinner party setting. It's kind of a rich event. Jesus is the guest of honor. And when Jesus shows up, he's kind of like those guests. You just never know what they're going to say. So let's look at what happens in today's passage from Luke 14, beginning in verse 1. Then we're going to jump to verse 7. Verse 1 says, On one Sabbath, when Jesus went to dine in the house of the ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. Verse 7 says, Now, he told a parable of those who were invited. When he noticed how they chose the places of honor, say to them, When you invite by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to that person, and then you'll begin the walk of shame to the Lord's place. <laughs> but when you're invited, go sit to the Lord's place, so when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher, then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus was invited to an important society party. Those attending were the leading citizens. The Pharisees, the wealthy, the teachers, the politicians, the high priests, members of the Sanhedrin, which was the Senate of the day. Everybody was dressed up. Everybody was on good behavior, smiling whether they meant it or not, being clever and making sure no food was hiding on a tooth. They looked like they were having a good time. Jesus was the guest of honor, and everybody who thought they were important wanted to be seated next to Jesus. That's where all of the important people are seated. The last person to sit down would be the guest of honor, which is Jesus. Everyone wanted to be at the head table, but pretended they didn't. The Christ spoke, and that's not always a good thing. I mean, you don't want to turn Jesus loose at a party because he may say something which will hit your heart. <laughs> then he says, Why are all you people trying to be so important? Why are you so anxious to be seated at the head table? People are kind of shuffling in their seats, looking around, wondering, where is this going? Jesus goes on and eventually says, For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. That then there's that nervous laughter. Nobody knows quite how to respond. He's hidden home, but nobody was that minute. They're thinking, 
Jesus must be talking about someone else. He certainly ain't talking about me. <laughs> Let's stop at this point. But it really, before it really gets worse. If that's all that Jesus said, that would be bad enough. But he's not close to being done. You see, whether we want to admit it or not, we all want to have a place of honor. We want people to recognize us. We don't want to be warm flowers. No, people don't want notor notor notoriety. Sorry. I prefer to be behind the scenes. But you still want people to notice you. We all need that. That's really a basic human need. We are created for relationship. We want to be recognized. Not even praised, which we need, but we want people to know that we have lived. We see people do this on their own all the time. Just look at Facebook. Oh, sorry. Facebook. Now, I grew up in the Caribbean island of Jamaica. The Jamaican word for extremely inquisitive is fast. So my sister calls Facebook fastbook. It is that book, it's that thing on the internet where people you haven't seen for 30, 40, 50 years suddenly are interested in what you're doing with your life. Don't write it quickly. I stay away from it where possible. However, I digress. You have Instagram, you have TikTok, or Twitter. Check out all the posts where people are praising themselves. They're posting pictures and making comments about themselves because they want recognition. I'm not going to get into the psychology of it all, but what they want is for others to recognize what they're doing. Now, I must say, posting a birthday or anniversary picture or milestone event is wrong. That's about all I am willing to post. But maybe we need to consider what our actions are representing and ultimately showing our, what our deeper needs are. Then it's to look how we can satisfy those needs, not through the comments of others, but through God. When we think about Christian virtues, we need to uphold, we usually think about love first. And I would say love is the predominant virtue of the Christian faith that we should demonstrate. But I think close behind it is humility. It seems that the disciples were arguing over who was the greatest or going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. So notice how Jesus responds in Matthew 18. And calling to him a child, he put the child in the midst of them and said, Truly I say unto you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Most of, would say, of us would say that the greatest in the kingdom is the person who has faith like a child. But that is wrong. But in this story and in other story, what makes a child great is not their faith, but their humility. Check out this passage. Jesus said, whoever humbles themselves like a child. What makes a child great is the profound awareness and quality of life where there's no need to be better than others. Have you ever noticed that young children aren't worried about pride and arrogance? They do not share well, but they are not prideful. Most children have humility. If we are to be true followers of Christ, we need to learn humility. What does it mean to be a humble person? What is Jesus talking about? To be humble, does it mean to feel inferior? Or to put yourself down? Does it mean to have an inferiority complex? Obviously not. Does humility mean to be means you need to be timid? 
to be a mouse in the corner, to be a Melvin milk toast, to be afraid to say anything to anyone, to be afraid to stand up for yourself? Obviously not, no. So the question is, what is a humble person? Humility is the opposite of pride and conceit. We often easily identify that in others. Remember, it's not having a healthy image of yourself or even being able to admit that you're good at something. That's not pride or conceit. Pride is to take the gifts of God that has been given to us and to and use those gifts to compare ourselves and elevate ourselves above others around us. We use our God-given gifts and talents in such a way as to make ourselves seem better than others. According to the seven deadly sins, pride is first. Pride often is the source of all other evil. It's the source of greed, envy, covetousness. It's closely related to selfishness. They tend to think in terms of wanting the world to revolve around them. Jesus asked, who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? The answer is, whoever humbles themselves like a little child. At the heart of this quality of humility is an attitude of the heart which realizes that all my gifts and talents come from God. All my money, my possessions, my eternity, my clothes, my job, my good looks, <laughs> my personality. That, all that I have is a gift of God. Humility is grounded in a deep awareness that everything I am and everything I really have is totally a gift from God. Without God, I am nothing. Therefore, how can I boast? How can I use these God-given gifts as a measured stick to elevate myself above others? And such humility is not without earthly rewards. As Jesus probably indicates, when you humble yourself, you allow others to lift you up. And they may very well lift you up higher than you would have placed yourself. Think about it. Is the promotion or award given to you by your boss for your work well done so much better than the one that you fought, connived, cajoled, schemed, and bargained for? Simply because you wanted that job. How about remembering? Everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. With that in mind, let's move to the final section of Scripture in Luke 14. In verse 12, Jesus says that the man who invited him, to the man who invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors lest they also invite you in return to be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. This gets into another dynamic. Really, it's the Latin phrase of quid pro quo. In a sense, quid pro quo means you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Or tit for tat, one hand washes the other. It's an exchange of one favor for another. That is what Jesus is talking about here. You see, there's no humility involved. When I say I'm going to invite all the elite of Asbury Park to my banquet, because I know they have to invite me to their banquet, it's a quid pro quo. 
It's as if Jesus now looked at the dinner host who's really ready to run and says to them, Why didn't you invite my friends to the party? Why didn't you invite the poor, the sick, the blind, the lame? Why didn't you invite the lepers? Where's the prostitutes? Where's the homeless? Why did you not invite all these people? To be a Christian and walk the Christian life is to break through the sociological barrier, um, barriers of status. Christ wants us to break through our sociological barriers of status where our friendships, our sociological patterns, and our Christian companions are primarily and only with middle or upper class people. You see, we are always thinking about what could benefit us in the long run. What relationship can I develop because it will help my business or will help my social network? But that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about humbling ourselves so that we can invite those who have a real need. Too often, a world is stuck in watching every move the Kardashians make and what the wives of Beverly Hills or whoever knows what city they are in now <laughs> doing more and more. We are all, but that's, diff but that's a whole different world. It's not a world of humility. It's a world of pride, arrogance, and conceit. So Jesus calls us to stop, take stock of who we are. Why do we do what we do? Who do we associate with and why? Finally, and then there's Jesus who basically said, yeah, that old quid pro quo thing, that's not going to fly in the kingdom of God. We may ask, why not? Christ answers by saying, let me tell you why. The problem with a quid pro quo mentality is in the calculation. How do you measure or calculate the payment of love and mercy? And the fact that we think we can becomes a major theological problem. We tend to forget that our beliefs about faith and discipleship also claims about who we believe God is. If we insist that our faith, our salvation, is dependent on an equal rate of exchange between God and us, then we need to ask ourselves, in what kind of God do we believe? Does this not cheapen the grace of God? How can we quantify the grace of our God? How can we calculate the cost of our salvation? We can't. It's never quid pro quo in God's economy. Frankly, there's no calculation. Why? Because it's a free gift of God's grace extended into our hearts, our spirits, and our minds. Because we at one time humbled ourselves admitting we are sinners in the need of redemption. Friends, as we, about, we go about this week, God's call is to humble ourselves, to count others as better than ourselves, so that we can show them the love, grace, courage, and power of Jesus Christ. Amen.